family song. <laughs> hello, 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 and welcome everybody to the 261st episode of the Hungry Gamers podcast. We are powered by 8bit.net and the hapless souls of others. I'm your extremely humble and haunting host, Brendan White. You can find me just about everywhere at Brendan8bit. And joining me today, my partner in crime, my final girl associate, the Ellen Ripley to my Sydney Prescott. You can find her on them socials at Miss Ali Hart. Miss Ali Hart, how are you doing this fateful All Hallows Eve almost? 30th? Is that Hallow's Eve? No, it's tomorrow. Or it is Hallow's Eve. For you. I don't know. Um, oh, wait. No, yeah, Halloween is on Sunday. Yes. Anyway, we're up to a good start because I didn't see that you um, had pressed the, like, record, like, started the intro. So that initial, like, at the start scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> Full disclosure, was that a soundbite or was that not? Um, it might not have been because uh, for anyone playing at home about guess that mysterious squelchy sound, it could have been Bentley's anus because uh, the poor little fella had a infected anal gland this week. Oh, wow. That is something. Yeah. I've been <laughs> I've been living my, uh, my animal body horror life this week. Took him to the vet just because uh, the poor little mate wasn't doing too well. And poor old vet surgeon... Uh, got him up on the table, had a look at his bum, went, "Yep, yep, looks like it's uh, uh, infected. Needs a little bit of a uh, bit of pressure to to relieve some of that tension." And uh, that little anal gland shot like a howitzer missile straight out into the vet's chest, bounced up, like sort of splashed up onto his chin and on his face and whatever. But this guy was just so deadpan and just so relaxed about it all. And I was like, I was at the like at the front of the table, sort of holding Bentley just to keep him calm. That happened, and Bentley and I had this moment where I looked at him, and he looked at me, and we were just like, "We're in trouble now, aren't we?" But the vet was like, "I'll be right back. I'm just going to grab a bit of towel and clean myself off, but uh, I'll be right back, and we'll finish this off." So, uh, yeah, Bentley is quite the uh, the sharpshooter with uh, <laughs> with those glands, but um, yeah, antibiotics is clearing that up, and it's looking less and less like a horror wound, and. Uh, yeah, was that squelch coming to you live from the uh, Coburg Veterinary Clinic? Who knows? But uh, we're here. It is spooky season, so we thought we'd uh, change our usual uh, THG agenda up a little bit and just talk all things scary and mm. horrific and gory and all those uh, horror-based adjectives and verbs <laughs> and just anything anything spooky, really. We're uh, yeah. not going to worry about any, any news for... For the most part, there is there is a tweet of the week we will mention that uh, ties into the news. But for the most part, we're looking at sort of evergreen, scary content. So we've got a, a great amount of questions from listeners uh, that we're going to sort of tackle, share our insights and our input on. But maybe we could start with sort of a, a pseudo review, uh, which ties into the spooky season, Ooh. Miss Hart, because we've both been playing uh, the Dark Pictures House of Ashes uh, which is the uh, the second last entry to season one of this uh, anthology that Supermassive Games are working on. So shout out to Bandai Namco for tossing us a couple of keys, and we've been both been playing on the uh, Xbox Series X. Miss Hart, how have you been finding the House of Ashes so far? So uh, when you told me like, "Hey, we're going to play this and stuff like that," I got so worried because I like I really don't play horror games because I understand that horror games scare me. Uh, so I don't actively pursue them. But then you were like, yep, we have to play it. And I'm like, oh, we, we have to play it now. So I've actually been really, really anxious in playing it. Um, so I do appreciate that there is this kind of uh, like online multiplayer co-op mode that we got to experience and kind of glad we did uh, as we discovered soon when it came to seeing um alternative storylines as opposed to the kind of linear one that you experience in a single player mode. But um, I, I don't know, like based on where this game was set, I was like, how could it be that scary? Like it, it'll be fine. Right. And no, no, it has, it has its ways to give you the sweats. It, it does indeed. So um, I, I've, I've done 
a full playthrough just as a singular solo experience. And mm. then, yeah, as, as Ali mentioned, you can also play this together, whether it be in a couch co-op fashion where you pass the controller around with people in the room with you, or you can play online and create a party with a couple of people and then, then they would assume characters along the way. So uh, you do have direct control over how these characters interact. Like anyone that's played a, a super massive game, anyone that's played anything from from Dark Pictures or they've played Until Dawn, they know that you can control the narrative. You can control how these characters interact. Are they going to be sweet and charming? Are they going to be dickish and assholey? Are they going to be, uh, you know, trying to help or hinder, really, is, mm. is a way to sort of push it forward. And then you combine that with those various quick time events where you've got to press... Yeah buttons or aim in a certain direction to make uh, you know some type of contact to an enemy because a lot of the times um, in these games these characters that we're controlling they, they don't have a, a, an infinite shelf life like they could oh. die opening scene of this game if you're not careful you know one missed uh, quick time event button press or one missed aiming and then hitting the right trigger to fire or cause an attack if you miss that chance there's a chance that that character you're playing is uh you know finito they're dead do not pass go proper gone scrap from the narrative and then the, the story just adjusts and keeps moving forward which which i love the stakes are so high in these games because the characters that you might get attached to or that you might despise and hope they die or whatever <laughs> uh you know you can control how they how far they progress but if you yeah aren't paying attention if you're checking a text or, or having a sip of drink and then all of a sudden a QTE pops up, you're like, fuck, press X. Oh, no, if you, A, and no, now the character's dead. Like, it happens that quick and there's no, like, reset and wind the clock back. It's not. That narrative is moving forward and those characters that just died, they're staying behind. You know, that's <laughs> it. Y your group has shrunk and you've got to try and survive. But, um, yeah, the story, the story is... Um, Really, really interesting. Like, uh, it's it's set in uh, 2003 uh, during mm. sort of the Iraq War, and uh, you're handling a group of uh, you know American Marines, and uh, you've got five characters at your disposal, and you you've you found this in air quotes bunker that's housing Saddam's you know weapons of mass destruction, you know chemical warfare and all that. So, so you sort of do this uh, assault on this little farm village to, to get into this bunker to find these weapons and then things turn south really quickly, really. The story is, uh, you know, so much more than a, a, a missile silo. Yes. It uh, goes in some very, very, very interesting directions and um, it's insane. Like, I don't want to give away any of, the, any of the story because just seeing this thing unfold in front of you and where they take it and just keep building on this world, I was in or and in love with this um with this story i really really liked it i liked that they managed to keep the stakes high the whole time i liked the assortment of characters There's a few characters that were dickish yes and i guess they just lent into a lot of that american hoorah machismo yeah, american are the best type of thing which which you get with a lot of these tropes but uh salim othman uh, who is who is sort of a foil to these guys. So you've got a group of American Marines and then you've got an Iraqi army lieutenant who sort of goes into this uh, situation as well. And Salim is the the MVP of this game for me. I loved him and I loved playing him and his sort of uh, you know story progression and character development was really cool to see. But mm. uh, Miss, have you finished yet? Have you no, finished? Have you got no, to the end? I, I, I definitely pushed through a, a few hours out because like I unfortunately... Um, I'm, I'm a little like time poor to play video games this week, but I definitely um, threw in a few good hours in and I'm, I'm definitely seeing the story progress. And I agree, Salim is the probably one of the better characters in um, that you take command of. Um, I am seeing a lot of my opinions of uh, characters just change very, very quickly. Um, I don't think I ever tried to do anything to purposefully make people shitty. Um, I always try to do the best, um, best reactions of people and try to not put my own, um, kind of emotion into it. I try to mm -hmm. you know, vibe with the characters and such. Uh, ov overall, like I, I love these kind of games in the sense that I like the idea that you're play you've played it and you've had one experience and there's a 
great chance that I'm going to have a completely different one than you. So obviously you're probably really biting at the nail to hear for me to finish it and see what happened with my um, narrative. But I swear like this, having these lives in my hands and knowing that just any split decision that I make will just completely change the experience and just losing someone like that anxiety drives me nuts. It keeps you on the edge of your seat the entire time. Like, like I did. Um, my first run probably came in somewhere between five and six hours, mm. I'd say. And yeah, e- even when we got the the media copies and sort of the uh, the review guidelines from from Bandai, it sort of says it recommended to to be able to, in air quotes, a full comprehensive review. Play this game a minimum of twice through, and and then also experience that sort of co op or or multiplayer um, mode as well because. Because yeah, like my my first playthrough out of the five, four of my five survived. Oh nice! So uh, that that's the benchmark to see if you can uh, get above that. I was feeling pretty good for the most part, but then uh, yeah, a fateful situation played out at the near the back end of the game, and I, I lost one of my troops. But I'm not going to say what, who, or how. But yeah, the cool thing was like when we played the the sort of online uh, co op together, where we were controlling specific characters in certain junctures. It also then unfolds more story for you. Yeah. So you start seeing other things that you didn't get from that solo experience where you can start going, oh, okay, so this is why they did that. Or here's some additional dialogue or here's a secret because these games you find so many things on... There's so many like diary pages in all these games. Like, I- people just leave their <laughs> paperwork everywhere in these games and you're picking them up and you're getting story uh, unfolding in front of your eyes and Mm -hmm. secrets getting disclosed and getting the premonitions as well where you can sort of uh, see the the upcoming scene that that might occur. So you can sort of start to already think, okay, that's going to happen. I know that I need to sort of counteract this by doing that. So it's kind of cool that you've got all these things in the back pocket at any given time. Yeah, yeah, though, but those things screw with me so many times. Those like kind of uh, premonition plates that you kind of find. Um, because I'm like, am I seeing what I'm supposed to do or am I seeing what to avoid? Like, what, what exactly am I seeing here? Is it a warning? Is it a guide? Like, so those things are also messing with my head. But you're right, there's so many um, items of like, uh, like secret items, collectibles, anything just to kind of give you more information about the story. And unfortunately for me, I have to check everything. I have to check, ev- yeah. I have to check every corner because I know that there's a collectible maybe somewhere. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's slowing me down. Uh, I, I think I'm probably sitting at between three to four hours of gameplay. So I could be closer towards the end. Um, so uh, hopefully it won't take me too long to get you, um, an answer on seeing who, um, I, who I keep, who I keep. Yeah. Alive. I'd love to know who, who makes it through to the end on your playthrough, but like, there's so many things I want to say as far as what I compare this game to, but I don't, then it would just give away and allude to too much. I think as far yeah. as, okay, if, if you've watched or played this, you'll love that type of thing. And, and I don't want to spoil anything for anyone listening. So if you've got a spare couple of bucks in your back pocket, I'd really recommend picking this game up, especially now with with restrictions easing around the world. Like if you can get some people together around your house and, you know, pass the control around where you're controlling one of these five individual characters and, and having your own experiences, but also then playing off each other, I think that could be really fun. That would be fun, so, yeah. um Yeah, if, if you could get four people in your house plus yourself to play this and all yeah, take control of, of these very uh, diverse and, and unique characters. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be awesome. Like, I had a killer time, uh, no, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> playing by myself. But yeah, if I was to play this with, with yourself longer and then also then bring in some other people, I think it would really add to that bloody blanket of tension that you're wrapped in playing these games. Yeah, I, like the, the online experience that we um, we played, um, it, it was great and it was awesome kind of to seeing these like... Um, the contrast between the initial single player experience as well and just watching how our decisions um, impacted each other's choices for the like for the game future gameplay so it's very it's very creative and I'm a little surprised that we're not seeing more of this in like a it doesn't necessarily have to be horror genre but um, mm. in other genres too it's it's a good like um, online multiplayer kind of experience yeah like super super massive have sort of cornered the market in this sort of uh, horror interactive horror genre haven't they like uh until dawn was the the game that put them on the map but this dark pictures anthology where we've got 
three of a planned eight. So there's going to be four in, in season one and then there's going to be another four in season two. So it's awesome Ooh. to know that we've got another five of these things to come uh, over the next couple of years. And as as sort of the, you know, the, the technology gets better, these games get better, the, the graphics and the mocap looks phenomenal. Yes, there's some weird things like where the, the facial details, especially the eyes, eyes in these games look really, really well done, but then the teeth. Teeth it feels like they ran yeah. out of time and go, you know what? Scan in that piece of juicy fruit and clone that thing 20 <laughs> times and stick them in their mouth, you know? Like teeth the teeth is a thing in games that can be a bit of a bit of a detriment, but overall yeah. I thought the acting was really good and, and the characters, uh, you know, the, the actors that, that sort of lent their likenesses and voices to these characters felt like they were, they were putting in a lot of good energy and Oh, effort. definitely, yeah. Um, the, the voice acting and like kind of like, yeah, the, I assume they did mocap as well the, the yeah, particular yeah. i watched a couple of the um when as you play you unlock certain bonuses as well so there's uh director's diaries and oh, interviews cool. with some of the actors and actresses so you can sort of see them in in um getting getting this work done before the game obviously becomes fully realized but uh That's awesome. the review scores like it's been it's been lukewarm i think uh it ranges from 71 to 74 depending on the platform on metacritic so you know, seven out of ten or so. I'd I'd probably put it at maybe an eight for me. You know, an eighty. I I've really enjoyed it as far as the story and and maybe your score is going to be a bit of a work in progress at the moment because you haven't sort of fully rolled it out. But we did cop a couple of weird bugs. Yeah. In the when we played online, I I played through solo and outside of a couple of like uh, texture pops. Uh, in, in a few big scenes where it was half a second too late and you'd see then just the fidelity pop up on a statue or whatever. Yeah. Outside of that, it was all pretty good. But when you and I were playing, we had a couple of situations where the game like cloned characters, like the, the model was frozen and then the, the scene would progress and so then a duplicate of the character would start moving and then the, the model was still stuck there. I also so had, that was a little bit weird. I also had a missing character in a scene, which is, <laughs> to me, like I love this sort of stuff because it doesn't ruin it for me. I just have a good giggle. Um, yeah. So just a missing model for like only like a few seconds. But yeah, either way, um, that, that's that's a, probably about it, apart from, like you said, like the texture pops as well, but um, nothing too bad. Yeah, and and just if you've played the other games, you'll you'll be, or if you've played like a Resident Evil game, especially the the controls aren't the smoothest, and the movement is it feels like your character's like a big boat almost, yes, like yes. they sort of turn very very slow and very wide, and so um, yeah, you're not going to be you're not, you're not a nimble character in this game. There is our QTEs that uh, have has your character running. Thankfully, you don't really control them outside of the button timings, but when you're just generally walking around and interacting. You're very slow and meandering and, and can't really turn on a dime. <laughs> no, not really. But yeah, overall, I'm really digging it and I'm looking forward to hearing how your final experience plays out and who lives and who dies. I bet but, they all uh, die. I bet it. I, just, I, I feel this <laughs> bad feeling. Like, like I, to say this game gives me anxiety, like, it, like, my poor husband was, like, sitting next to me as I was, like, playing it and then I was just, like, <gasps> like, 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 constantly, like, holding my breath and stuff because I'm, like, mm. I don't want that happening. Yeah, it, it's like that, and it's like because you've got to you've got to have that that controller or that keyboard mouse in your hands the whole time yes. because you never know when something's going to pop up. You exactly. can't just oh, I'll just just Check go my quickly phone grab for a five drink. Seconds. Yeah, it was, like it was if you my need phone. to check your yeah. phone. <laughs> yeah, if you need to check anything or grab a drink or go to the bathroom, luckily you can pause it, so you can press start and pause it and go do your thing and come back. Because if you let this thing roll, there's a fair chance someone be dead by the yeah. time you get back. Okay. just take a sip and then someone dies and you're like oh well exactly that's, that's it yeah yeah that's the end of my run but yeah four out of five of the people survived for me so i'm uh curious to know anyone else that's played it who lived who died slide into my messages and uh let me know because i'd love to talk the story and just the concept and the characters and yeah who made it and who didn't in your run because it's, it's really good i really enjoyed playing this miss Hart. yeah I'm, I'm i am like i'm anxious but excited to finish it and seeing what happens in the end so yeah, yeah. Like for for me at the moment, like I'd I'd put that eight bit approved badge on it, but I want to wait and see if it's going to be a uh, you know a jointly agreed approved. So yeah. uh, we'll report back in the coming week or two. Hopefully, you'll you'll have rolled credits in uh, by future think, episode. Yeah. I don't think I can keep it hanging for that long. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. I hope not. And um, on the other on the topic of of sort of spooky and horrific, I watched a movie 
a week or so ago now, but I sort of held off talking about it until this episode because I thought it'd tie in nicely. And uh, I watched Malignant, Mm -hmm. which is a release that's just hit the cinemas. Depending on where you are in the world, it came out in like the States um, in sort of middle of September. Mm. Uh, It's just hit the cinemas a week or so ago here in Australia. And uh, Malignant is a supernatural horror done by James Wan, obviously, who is uh, one of the uh, the modern-day horror savants, you could say, obviously, uh, cut his teeth creating and, and directing and writing Saw. So uh, no, he got put on the map with that, and then he's done all the other big horror franchises that are kicking around now. Like um, He's definitely had involvement, yeah. Yeah, like he done Insidious, he's done, like he created the Conjuring universe, so he's, he's making so much money from horror. And, um, yeah, Malignant, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of... In that uh, giallo type of type of subgenre of horror, uh, the film it's got Annabelle Wallace is playing um, a woman who has visions of people being murdered, and then she realizes that these visions are actually happening in real life. Is sort of the the basis and the premise for this, and mm-hmm. is it like a supernatural thing or a being or just someone killing these people? And then the stakes just escalate from there. But yeah, supernatural horror really really sort of tense and slow and foreboding to begin, but then. It's like the adrenaline level gets turned up to 75,000. The third act in this movie is some of the most crazy, bonkers, unexpected cinema that I've seen in years. That's what I've been hearing. And um, I'm keeping a broad brush here because I don't want to give anything away as far as the story and the realisation and the plot twists. But holy guacamole, is this one of the funnest craziest bonkerish horrors i've seen in a long time why yes it is and uh oh. i highly recommend people checking this out because it goes in directions i did not expect and somehow they managed to keep it on the rails even though the rails just go up down round and round in that third <laughs> act it all stays together and um it works and my jaw was on the floor. There was times I was laughing. There was times I was shocked. There was times I was horrified. And it oh. was just a experience that I will remember for quite some time. It was, um, yeah, that third act was unlike the, the rest of the movie in a big way, but also in a good way. Like, um, it just goes places that I didn't envision it was going to, but it, and it works. It well, really, really works. See, the third act seems to be the contrasting opinion between people who have seen that movie. Some people think that that third act really, you know, cha- you know, like kind of like what you said, it really changes it up. It makes it kind of unique. It's kind of wild kind of thing. And then there's other people that have kind of responded by saying, what the fuck happened? What? Ha- why did it change in the third act? Like, so some people didn't like the change and some people seem to do like the change. So oh, this, it should be good to see um, some contrasting opinions on this movie. Yeah, it's it's very divisive where they take this. Like, it's not expected at all, but yeah. I think it worked and it worked really well and it just then made this movie sort of further stand on its own. Like, the first two acts, it's a lot of those standard supernaturally tropes. horror tropes. Yeah. So it feels like, I wouldn't say paint by numbers, but it's like, oh, yeah, I can sort of see where this is going and I've... I've watch similar similar content over the years but then that third act i'm like um i beg your pardon james Wan. what happened here this is insane but i am loving everything about this oh i'll have to make time for it put it on that bloody long list of things i need to watch so um but i think i'm going to keep on looking into some people's opinions of it now especially uh people from australia are starting to get their eyes on it so yeah it is it is absolutely bananas what happens in that third act but i i loved it and it really really elevated the movie for me but as you said there's some people where they're like oh my god this has just gotten too much now yeah. you know it's it's ruined the movie but i think i'm in the hopefully i'm in the majority where they were like yes this is awesome because i've talked to a few other friends like like cat who um hosts the tgif podcast she loves this movie it's one of her favorite movies she's seen oh, in, wow. in a long time and, and she's uh one of the the purest horror fans that i know so it's uh getting big praise from her and um a lot of her constituents and other friends i know on there they're like yeah this is this was fucking sick check it out check okay. it out malignant okay. all right Go watch it at the cinema if you can. If not, I watched it online. I'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah, it was really, really good. I can't go to the cinemas yet, Miss Hart. We're still, uh, we're still barred. But uh, check it out. It was, it was awesome. It was awesome. It was awesome. But um, we might park that discussion here 
and uh, jump onto or jump into the mystery machine and maybe start uh, deep diving on a slew of questions that have come our way, Miss Hart. What do you reckon? Shall we do that? Let's do it. The first question, Miss Hart. What is the dumbest slash stupidest thing to have ever legitimately scared you in a game? And this comes via way of El Pete's. Miss Hart. <sighs> Like, the, probably the stupidest, it's like not stupid, but it's kind of stupid. And I've, I've talked about it before on the podcast, but um, like being stranded in the ocean in Sea of Thieves. Like, I don't mind when you're near an island and I know I can kind of swim towards the island. But if you're like, if we're like sailing and dead in the middle of the ocean, and there's no land and it's dark and then the sh- ship sinks or I get knocked off the ship. Oh, it kills me. Um, It really, really destroys me. There was one time. I tried playing Sea of Thieves alone and just manning my own boat. Whoa, um, yeah, and, that's a bit scary. And then um, for the most part, I was like, cool, I'm just cruising. I'm just enjoying my time on the sea. But unfortunately, I got caught in a storm and then some people attacked me. And as I was like sinking and then I was like heading into the dark ocean by myself, I was like, I like, I just instant quit. I just quickly quit out of the game because I could not handle being in that ocean by myself in the dark. So that like like that legitimately is like one of my like phobias just wide open ocean and then the the darkness and the depths below and ugh, i can't handle it i feel it. you i, I feel you on that it. like like ocean whether you you're in it for real or in a game being in those depths or just not being able to see the bottom or seeing what's underneath you just adds this extra layer of fear and uncertainty and unease yeah, like um, you can be attacked from any direction yeah like up yeah, down and, around like oh and then the fact in a lot of these games is you genuinely don't know what they've put into these oceans like yeah you've got your standard fish and sharks and whatever but then they can standard put all sharks. kinds of horror <laughs> was that you said standard sharks standard fish sharks and i'm like standard sharks the sharks scare me in that game like they just come out of nowhere <laughs> Yeah, but then like, you know, like like Sea of Thieves or some of these other sort of uh, nautical-based games where they've got, you know, krakens and, and other types of just like Megalodon. nightmare fuel sea <laughs> creatures that just come and get you. Like, not, not going to downplay a shark. Sharks are scary as fuck. Like, even in real life, like swimming in the ocean, especially when I can't touch the bottom anymore, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm out here, but I don't feel as comfortable as I did a metre back when I could touch the ground, like, you know? Yeah, I think sharks are cool. Like, I like, I especially like seeing them, like, in aquariums or any kind of that sort of thing. I think they're great. But, like, when I'm in putting myself in this immersive experience, then it's not so cool. It's not yeah, so cool. I've played um, a couple of sort of uh, oceanic or nautical-based games in VR, and those ones as well, oh. that's some next-level some next level unease like nothing can hurt you but the fact that it's just fully wrapped around your peripheral and you can't see or hear anything else but the the sounds of the ocean and a a shark attacking you in a shark cage or whatever like oh my god that gets the heart racing uh miss hart you've also mentioned another uh sea-based animal that uh (laughs) freaks you out a little bit this is probably the most stupid one i just remember like always getting anxious playing um super mario 64 on um the jolly roger bay level um there's like a scene where you're swimming under the water and there's like that eel that comes out and gets you and it just it scares me every time when i'm not paying attention and just this thing just comes out it's like that that's that's definitely kind of giving me the heebie-jeebies as well so those (laughs) big creatures underwater just it's always going to get me Uh, i'm going to add add some more uh things that sort of freak me out a little bit but I think it was a mixture of just the difficulty plus the underwater aspects is like some of these games where you either need to, uh, you know, you've got to swim for a certain way and then like find like a some type of object in, in the ocean that's like spitting out air bubbles and things like oh, that. Yeah. So any of those games where you're swimming and then your, uh, your oxygen levels are getting low and then you oh. start seeing your health bar dwindle, that kind of stuff freaks me out Sonic. too. Like the thought of drowning... <laughs> Uh, in a game or in real life is is really, really scary for me and really unnerving. And then, like, the swimming levels in the old traditional, uh, you know, side-scrolling platformers where you've got to swim and you sort of got to time your, I guess, your jump swim move to get around jellyfish or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever type of sea creature, those levels used to always freak me out a little bit too as a kid. 
for yeah. some weird reason. Like I remember playing like Alex Kidd or Super Mario Brothers two or three or whatever when you're in the in the water, and you've got to avoid the the big fish with the lips or yeah some type of you know shock creature or a spiky spiky thing and and all that type of stuff back then used to really freak me. Like Donkey Kong Country when you're Echo underwater and stuff like that. Yeah, Echo yeah. the Dolphin. That's supposed to be the like water a- is a scary place, Miss Hart. I know, and like, <laughs> like I can appreciate the, you know, majestic beauty of underwater and stuff. But unfortunately, there's just this level, like this layer of the unknown, and like I said, just the opportunity of being attacked from any which way that just I think puts me on edge. Ugh. Yeah, because that that was a tough question. Because like dumbest or stupidest thing to scare you like because there's a lot of obviously things in games aimed to scare you but trying to think outside of that box is to things that um you know most people would probably find fine yeah like, like uh, you know freaked us out i think some people like may have like kind of like laughed at the idea of me being compl- incredibly anxious like especially when playing sea of thieves with a group of people and me just being like can you guys go get the treasure and I'll stay on the ship? Like, I know it sounds like a really, like, wussy thing out, but I'm like, I can't go in there. I can't. I can't. Especially because the water effects are so good. They're good. (laughs) A little too good. Which makes it even scarier. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. Swimming in Sea of Thieves is is still sketchy. But uh, the next question, scariest moment in your gaming past? I'm such a little bitch when it comes to horror games that I got my mate to come over to my house and play Fear while I watched from my bed. Still to this day, I'm a little bitch with horror games. I don't know why. Maybe it's like a hidden anxiety thing or something. I can watch horror movies all night or watch someone playing a horror game, but put me in control and I tap out. So that comes via way of Till House over on Discord there. So scariest moment in your video game past. Like, I I think a lot of us can relate to what he's saying, like as far as... Uh, you and me especially, like, we we can watch horror movies and gore and everything to the yeah, cows come home. Exactly, yeah. But when you got to start controlling these outcomes, that's when the tension rises again and the stress and the anxiety all come and grab you. I, I'm exactly the same. Like, I... I love horror games. Like, don't get me wrong. I know I just previously said I can't play them, but I love, I love horror games. And so, um, thank God for like YouTubers and people who do Let's Plays. Um, one of my favorites, um, John Wolf, he plays a lot of horror games. So, um, I like, I always watch like horror games being played, um, on YouTube because I know I can't play them, but it's better just to get the experience from someone else playing it and I guess getting, having them get scared. So um, I'm exactly the same, you know, watch horror movies as much as you want. But uh, the second that you're in control, I think there's just this like weird like thing in your like in your body that kind of just starts saying like, even though it's not the case, you still feel like the stakes are higher, like because you're mm-hmm. in control. So yeah, yeah, I feel you. So as far as scariest moments in your gaming past, so I tried to avoid any game that was released maybe in the last five or 10 years, I tried to think back a little bit to to gaming when I was younger Mm. and so many still come to mind. So I won't go through the the full list, but the the biggest ones that stood out for me was playing the original Resident Evil in in the mid nineties. And the first time those goddamn infected zombie dogs smashed through the window, (laughs) like like any 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 window smash in Resident Evil always got me. It's like you knew it was only a matter of time before you ran past that window or that door or or whatever it is for the fiftieth time. This thing's gonna bust through eventually and scare the shit out of me. And those dogs jumping through because they were so much quicker than the old uh, meandering, slow shuffling zombies. And you know, dogs are just scary especially in games when they're angry or in movies when they're angry and they want to eat your face off. Mm -hmm. So those zombie dogs in Resident Evil 1 and then also, you know, jumping to Resident Evil 2, funnily enough, and uh, meeting the liquor for the first time where you get that cutscene walking down that hallway in the police department and the liquor's on the roof and then it drops to the ground, you know, you've got the the nice the nice CGI and, yeah, it's got, got its big tongue at you. And then it jumps at you with them big goddamn demon claws and... He was a lot stronger than a zombie. So it was, uh, you know, do I run and just sort of get through the door and breathe for a second or to try and fight this? And I remember just the blood pumping when I experienced that. And then, you know, things like seeing um, in the in the original Silent Hill game, Nightmare Alley and seeing things just start to shift and change into sort of that you know, that hellscape mm. look that the game pivots to at times. Uh, so, so they're the big ones. I was thinking back to when I was, you know, 
somewhere between 10 plus onwards of years of age with these games coming out in the, the mid to back end of the 90s. They're the ones that stick with me the most. Those traditional third person survival horrors with the fixed cameras and the, the blocky graphics, but just the tension that just was flowing at you like a fog in Silent Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, like I, I tried to remember the ones that like really like scared me the most. And I've, I've previously mentioned um, playing the grudge game on the Wii. Um, that one is definitely still one of the more scarier moments, but um, there is a, there's a character in um, Fatal Frame to Crimson Butterfly. And I just remember like this one was like, this got me so much that I stopped playing. So I've never actually finished Fatal Frame because of this character. Um, it, it's the Kusabi ghost. And um, the thing about it is it's terrifying looking for starters. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, but the other thing is that it would stalk you and follow you in certain areas and you could just get cornered and attacked by it. And the other problem is, is um, with um, Fatal Frame, your weapon is a camera. So usually you, all you have to do is it, it, it makes you confront ghosts. So you take a photo hmm. of it. But unfortunately with this ghost, the camera doesn't do anything. So I can't, you can't even attack him or anything like that. And so you're just staring at this terrifying ghost. And it just got to a stage where I was just like, I can't play this anymore. This damn game scares the crap out of me. So that is definitely another one where it was just like so damn scary that I just, I had to, I had to watch someone else play the game. Do you have any inclination to play it now that it's on the Switch? Because I think it, came, it either came out last week or it's it's... It's somewhere out in in the last yeah. several weeks or coming. I, I think it. I think it actually may have just recently come out this past week. Maybe I've definitely seen some mention. It's. I don't think it's Fatal Frame Two. It's the other one. It's the Widow yeah. one. Um, yeah. But no, not really, because <laughs> like I said, it's it's you. Your weapon is a camera, and they're just purposefully making it so you have to stop and look at the freaking scary thing that's yeah, coming. Yeah. Face at your you. fears. Exactly. So I. I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And and shout out though to Fear that uh, that was was terrifying oh, yeah. till house many many years ago. Alma is one of the best scary or horror based characters in in gaming that you'll experience. She's so creepy, I thought, and yeah. uh, it'll lead into future questions as well regarding her as and, and adding to that level of anxiety and fear and stress. But um, <laughs> yeah, the Fear franchise, it, Great. it was. It sort of really, really blazed the path as far as incorporating FPS and horror, mm-hmm. and uh, did it really well. obviously stuff like Doom and, and Quake and stuff came before that, but this really doubled down on the horror and the atmosphere and those jump scare moments. Yeah, I think it definitely brought its own thing. Although technically, I think when Fear came out, that's when we were starting to see an abundance of the scary little girl trope in horror. But like, I did like what Fear did. For like you said, like the action first person horror kind of combo, it was really good. Fear one, really, two. really good. And uh, speaking of good, Miss Hart, this uh, next question comes by way about GC Fabio from Discord, aka Benny Apiot. Best Halloween themed games as service events. This is something until probably the last couple of years wasn't really much of a thing. Like you saw certain events, like they've probably been long standing and stuff. Like wow where they've got these seasonal-based events every year that would tie into these these live games. But, uh, Miss Hart, what's 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 your favourite ones? And then I've sort of got a bit of a list of as far as ones that I like or even just games that are doing it these days, which is awesome to see. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned it last week on the podcast was Animal Crossing. They um, have a Halloween event, which is kind of cute. Um, a character called Jack usually comes on Halloween day and you have to before then in the month of October just just collect candies so then you can hand them out on Halloween and get gifts back and they usually have like little cute pumpkin um crafting abilities and you can make your island all spooky and you have cute little spooky interactions with your uh villages and stuff so that's really adorable um I always enjoy coming back to that um the other one is destiny's festival of of the lost it's a bit tedious but i like how they have um kind of developed on it through the years and added more to it and kind of made it more of a fun event inclusive for everyone as it used to be kind of just be a little bit of a mishmash i do enjoy that the festival of the lost is their own kind of incorporation of halloween and um you know 
think like the celebration of the dead and the, those that we have lost and um, the, they do have candy. So having this um, this kind of like candy hunt where you interact with these normally very serious guardians and members that you usually deal with and then having them kind of being like interactive on like, you know, candy and what is this and this is stupid or something like that. So I, I do kind of like the way that Destiny um, does a Halloween celebration. Yeah, it's really cool. And the fact that they they pimp out the tower for these yeah. themed events as well and you've got that spooky tree and, and all the other spooky sort of ornaments around the place, it adds a, adds a nice little change up to sort of the usual aesthetic and vibe you're looking for there. Um, the one that I've sort of personally played and was playing it just the other day, uh, Apex Legends, they've got the Monsters Within event this year for Halloween oh, and yeah. they've got a mode that they've brought back for, for sort of this time of the year called Shadow Royale. So what that means is... You've still got your traditional squads of three, but players, when they're killed, they come back in shadow form. So you're running around as these shadow ghosts and you can keep attacking. Like You don't have guns, you just run really fast. You can wall run and it's melee hitting and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. you can sort of be these evil, sinister spirits that try and guide your remaining living teammates to the end. Mm. So I like that little wrinkle and then obviously... Uh, with this game and a lot of these other sort of live uh, squad-based shooters and battle royales, all the Halloween-themed costumes you get, like Fortnite, they do a thing called Fort Nightmares. We've got Apex Legends with their skins. Uh, Rocket League uh, are currently running something called Haunted Hallows. Mm. Uh, we've got Pokemon Go with the Halloween Mischief. Obviously, you've mentioned Destiny 2 with uh, Festival of Lost. Minecraft has Spooky Fest. Uh, Rainbow Six Siege has Doctor's Curse. PUBG Battlegrounds has a Halloween update. Star Trek Online has the fall of the old ones. Oh. Uh, Team Fortress 2, Scream Fortress 8 is currently running there. So it's for TF2. Uh, Splitgate has Spooky Gate. No Man's Sky has the emergence um, experience that's come out. And then uh, Hitman 3 has Orson's Nightmare. And then even World of Tanks has a <laughs> horror-based event in World of Tanks. So that's just a, a small sort of slither of, of games that are doing things like that. And then, yeah, you've got your World of Warcrafts. Probably New World's got something going on. Maybe, mm. um, I know, Final Fantasy uh, 14 um, online has stuff going on I as think well. Call so, of Duty as well. Yeah, Call of Duty where you can play as bloody Ghostface yeah. of all, all people. You know, we've got that Scream collab. So, yeah, we've got a ton of uh, Halloween-based themed events. But, yeah, I think... I think you know, you know that like Animal Crossing does it really really well, In a and cute then way, um, yeah. Destiny Destiny does it well too. Um, well, maybe Destiny does it really really well, I'd say. But Animal Crossing, it's more of a subtle ode to these events where you can just uh, you know pimp your islands out and get some cool cool sort of decor. But yeah, give me give me um, Destiny two for the win there, just solely on the uh, you know they're not the best um armor sets the dinosaur armor sets but you know the fact that i've got a titan uh, a titan t-rex armor set now i'm happy it just works. that's, uh, that's yeah. all i need <laughs> makes sense that's all i need all right so is your next question what in horror and that's in parentheses because horror i think is is a term that can be interpreted in many ways yeah but uh, let's say, what in horror makes you squeamish, Miss Hart? Miss Hart? So, um, what are the things when you're playing a game or watching a movie or a TV show that make you squeamish and uncomfortable and freak you out a bit? Uh, not a lot gets to me. Um, like, a lot of the gory stuff doesn't really get to me too much. Oddly enough, the things that do make me go, Ugh, or make, have to make me look away, is actually needles. Um, especially if they ever go for real detail and you, you see the, like a close up and the needle kind of popping the skin, Ooh. that, ugh, that gets me every time. So as a person that's covered in piercings and tattoos. Is the, um, the old needle in the eye trope, is that the one that gets you the most? Yeah, where they well, anything, stick something through the eyeball? Ugh, anything like, like, even if it's just like someone like, so I can't, when I get a blood test done, I can't even look when I get a blood test done. I have to like look away because I can't. I can't see that. I can't, you know, like I can look at it once it's in, but like what that, it's that pop, it's that little, like I can watch someone get like, you know, gutted, sliced and all that sort of stuff. Easy, fine, no worries. But like the second it's a needle popping, like just popping the skin, I can't handle Game it. Game over Red Rover, huh? Yeah. And speaking of, I can't watch people vomit. I, for some reason, like just watching people vomit kind of gets to me as well. So 
which I think is Do you become of... like a surrogate vomiter then as well? Like where if you see someone vomiting, there's a chance you might vomit? <sighs> no, I, I think I like it's just more of a like, oh, that's gross. Like kind of oh, thing. Okay. I, it's not like it's not like a, yeah. Like a, like a retaliation vomit to someone else while vomiting. Yeah, not so. like a ripple effect no. where it just yeah flows to you. Yeah. Yeah. The um, I'm with you. Like I've watched a lot of real gory and and viscera laden stuff and played a lot of games like that where like that stuff. Yeah, it it's it's gross and it's shocking and stuff, but it's it doesn't hit the same as for me. It's when I'm watching or playing realistic violence so when when it's you know supernatural and one thing and all that kind of stuff uh is like something where i can sort of disconnect my brain i'm like it's supernatural it's it's monsters that stuff isn't real but when it becomes like that sort of uh real real um i guess it leans more into that thriller like that sort of um house house invasion uh, you know, torture type of violence and stuff like that where okay. you can put yourself in those these characters' shoes and see these things playing out in, in real-life situations. When it becomes grounded in a lot of realism, that's the stuff that really gets me. Like, like you mentioned the needles thing. Like, when you see, like, I don't know what it is, but, like, an, an Achilles getting sliced, which happens a lot in movies and games, mm. that thing still, like, really makes me, like, ugh, like, it makes me shudder. Like, that's... <laughs> That's one of those those injuries that really really gets me. Uh, so any any real slow drawn out types of violence gets me. Like if it's just like big explosion and a head's been blown to bits or an arm's been cut off, anything that's really quick is is usually fine. And I'm like, oh, that's that's gross, but cool. But when it's really slow drawn out tortury stuff, like you're seeing them, you know, rip fingers off one at a time, or fingernails, or teeth, or Ooh, anything like that. Yes, that's the stuff that really sort of you know gives me like makes the skin crawl yes actually fingernails like being ripped off like it doesn't happen too much but when it happens that does kind of make me go oh like you know that yeah yeah, for some reason fingernails being ripped off yeah so any of that slow slow drawn out pain inducing violence is is the stuff that gets me the most like i'm fine to watch people get disemboweled and cut up to bits and chewed up by monsters and whatever like don't get me wrong some of that still is shocking but when it's that layer that's sort of wrapped in realism and you go you know what this is high stakes stuff that you probably hear about or don't hear about happening all around the world all the time uh, that's the kind of stuff that sort of gets me gets me the most because it uh, it's hard to disconnect i guess and um, disconnect and, and not being able to relate to it so when i can start put myself in these people's shoes and whatever it's like oh yeah no thanks yeah. Uh, i'm sorry yeah but um yeah listen i'd love to know what uh what makes the listeners squeamish you know what yeah. what is it is it uh you know other things that sort of get me is seeing seeing violence on animals and and um things like oh. that whether the, the animal is bad even if it is you know a, a possessed dog it is still rough to see that dog yes. then yes get get terminated mm-hmm. uh or, or children so children and, and and animals in in horror movies and getting any harm done to them is something else that still always like makes me go oh, oh it's, it's tough to watch yeah i usually if if violence happens to animals i usually just turn off, turn it off <laughs> yeah that is uh That's in it. in the pile for you Sorry. never watch never play again yep exactly all right we've got our next one and this is a uh a fuck marry kill type of question so it's a bit of a quick one and um our three choices here to to yeah sleep with to marry and to kill we've got elvira mistress of the dark we've got morticia adams and we've got santanico pandemonium so miss hart who are you sleeping with uh elvira and based on current news i actually have that opportunity there you go. Yeah, I saw some um, some photos doing the rounds on social media with her and her uh, lovely female partner. There, they're looking mm. very happy together. Gorgeous. They like they're both couple. gorgeous. Yeah, they are stunning, especially for, for two back. women that I think in their fifties. Yeah, like yeah, definitely in their fifties, like mid to late fifties. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So may- maybe being um, you know attached to the dark is the is the secret to a long healthy life. Maybe yeah. maybe we need to sort of reevaluate ourselves there. So I'm uh I'm going to be sleeping with Morticia Adams. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you know creepy and they're kooky uh, for one. So I think it's going to be very creepy. interesting as far as things we get up to. I think there's there's not a high chance of 
afterwards, if we went our separate way, she's going to hunt me down and kill me, where the, the, the third person is, is high chance there. But, uh, you know, I just like her vibe. She's, you know, she's a, she's a great mother. She's a, a great wife. Maybe, maybe I should have married her in that regard for oh. that. But um, she's just a nice character. You know, amidst all the all the creepiness and and oddities and things, she's what just uh, she's just someone that uh, I think I think it'd be fine to to have a bit of fun with. No, Gomez would be down for it. I reckon he'd embrace the swinger lifestyle. He'd probably let Morticia do this, so I could probably go do this in. then go on my way. Probably want to join in. That's it. <laughs> See, just as long as old uh, Lurch doesn't come in too. That's the uh, that's the thing I want to avoid. What about the thing? Extra oh. hair. <laughs> Um, <laughs> cousin, it. Give me oh. all that hair. <laughs> Something to pull on. Um, I want to oh. marry. <laughs> I want to actually marry Morticia Adams because she has displayed herself as a wonderful, supportive wife. That's kind of up for everything. She's a great mother. She's, you know, she's got that level of sarcasm and dry wit. And you said she's got creepy things about her, but I love her style, her aesthetic, pastels. Um. I think she's fantastic, so I definitely think she's marriage material. Definitely, and we could share clothes; it'd be great. Yeah, she, she's a she's probably the smarter choice for this one. But I thought I'd just throw a bit of a spanner in the works here, and I'm going to marry Santanico Pandemonium, who was sort of one of the uh, I guess the the leaders of the the vampire nation, <laughs> uh, played by Salma Hayek or uh, Aza Gonzalez. So take your pick; they're both absolutely gorgeous women. Uh, you know, career choice. You know, I'm I'm not gonna say what they can and can't do as far as uh, how they want to earn a living. You know, being a being a um, a vampire stripper is is all well and good, I guess. You know, as long as you're not hurting anybody. But um, as you know, if you play, watch those movies or that TV show, a lot of people get hurt. But mm. I think I think if I was her husband, maybe I'd be safe from the uh, the pain. Maybe maybe I just become a blood sack and. She just feeds off me every night. I don't know. But, um, yeah, Salma Hayek is just uh, just something Look, else. So I, I had no choice. I had no choice here, Miss Hart. I'm already controlled by the vampires. I got no choice. I agree. But the, she's she's only like Salma Hayek for so much of the time. Like her real form is nasty. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, see? Her real form is really nasty. You think that being married to her gives her some kind of, like, moral compass. No. Um, no, kill her. Sorry. You look great. Um, you know, but... Maybe maybe that's why she's so angry, because she's looking for a man's. Maybe, maybe if I get her a man's, like, if I become her man's and we, we're husband and wife, maybe she's less, less angry and less vampire like the vampire tendencies become less and less and we just live a good life maybe we just uh just hang out at the titty twister and just have a beer and have a laugh maybe i don't know there's a chance i'm dead but there's a good chance you're dead i you're like i kind of said to you you're you're speed running marriage with her yeah yeah you know i've lived a good life and, and if, yeah if, if i meet my demise by selma hayek there's worse ways to go death so like snoo, i'm happy snoo. <laughs> all right and as far as kill this this was just because i had no one else left and i'm like elvira mistress of the dark i'm sorry my love but um i'm killing you i'm hoping because you are mistress of the dark you've got some kind of spell that can bring you back anyway and i figure you are like you are a character so there's, there's less chance of your vampire cronies or your creeping kooky family coming after me if i kill you i can probably get out of here scot-free as opposed to a vampire nation on my ass or something else. Maybe. You have a bunch of angry goths though. That's true. That's true. Yeah, and you're killing uh you're killing Santanico, so oh, you got definitely. the vampires coming after you. Ah, they won't know. <laughs> I got Morticia. Far, far I got Morticia uh... supporting me. She'll she'll know she'll know some people. That's it, yeah. Just stay far away from, from weird ass strip clubs out in the middle of the desert exactly. and you should be fine. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so the next question, come by way, Benny, over on Discord. Which horror movie scared you as a kid? Uh, so, I, like, I don't recall, like, watching horror movies as a kid. Like, uh, I think the first time, like, really kind of, like, watching a full-on horror was, like, way in my, like, mid to late teens, I believe. Um, but there was something that genuinely, like, rocked me as a kid, like, really, really disturbed me and, like, made it so I had sleepless nights. It was actually from The Goonies. 
Um, full disclosure, I actually haven't watched The Goonies. Like, I haven't sitting from start to finish. I haven't watched the whole movie. But um, there was when I was really, really young. I remember walking into my parents watching it, and there was a scene where Chunk is the character Chunk is being threatened mm-hmm. by three adults, and they're putting his hand in a blender going off like the blender's live it's spinning 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 and they're threatening to put his hand into the blender that scene fucked me up as a kid like i that like i couldn't sleep i was worried about these people that were going to come and put my hand in a blender like like it really really screwed with me yeah that that um like circling back as well loosely to the um the, the things that make you squeamish anything like that where you see an appendage going into like a blender or a meat grinder or anything like that. That stuff is always one of those heebie-jeebie moments. And I'm with you. Like there's a lot of movies we watch or movies that are targeted to families or, or kids, depending, I guess, how, um, you know, how, how relaxed the parents are as far as letting you watch these things where there's themes and scenes where you're like, this is fuck. I probably shouldn't have watched this as a kid. And, and that, with I your record, that there. there's a lot. Oh yeah, my record is horrible. Like I've seen many things that I should never have watched, but um, it turned out fine most of the time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, any anything like this where they're implying, yeah, to have a hand chewed to bits in a blender. Like I remember this. It's a family uh, movie, right? Kid, like yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah, the Goonies is, is a family shit. movie. Yeah, so I don't, I don't understand. Like, like to me that, like especially as a kid, seeing that, I'm like. I, like for the longest time, I thought I, I thought it was a horror movie until I found out it was The Goonies, and I'm like, wait, this is a movie that people talk about very fondly in their childhood. Why is yeah. the, why did I see this one thing that screwed me up for like a family good adventure movie? Classic, yeah. young Josh Brolin, looking good. Mm. Mm. But um, I'm I'm more down the horror route. So as Miss Hart mentioned, and as as we've sort of talked off off and on over the years, I watched a lot of things I shouldn't have when I was a kiddo. And the one that still stands out to me to this day is the original Pet Cemetery. So this is the movie from the 80s. And the character that freaks me out the most is funnily enough, not one of the bad like return from the dead gonna kill you characters. It's actually Victor Pascal. And he's he's a guy that um gets hit by a truck and he's sort of telling the main the main character who is having sort of dream-based flashbacks to this Victor Pascal guy all the time because he he sees his last moments in hospital after he's been hit by this truck and he's like <laughs> smashed to bits and looks yeah. terrifying. Uh, but he's in there like what going into his dream saying, don't go to the cemetery, stay away from there. It's an Indian burial ground. Da, da, da. Like, you know, stay away, bad shit will happen. So he's the good guy in this situation. <laughs> but just because he looks so freaky, uh, there was moments for weeks there where I'd have nightmares where he was coming into my dreams and saying stuff and then I'd get that scared so I'd go in and, and jump into bed with with mum and dad and then I'd see him like I'd sort of half wake or half stir mm-hmm. where mum was I'd see him laying beside me so it would freak me out even more and I was just on this horror loop of Victor Pascal who's not even that bad a dude and then the other one um, is watching The Howling, so one of the OG sort of oh, werewolf yeah. films. Yeah. I had a real, real, real bad fear of werewolves and wolves as a kid, and I had nightmares for months about like wolf attacks and, and <laughs> getting lost in out in the wilderness and getting chased by werewolves and all this kind of stuff. So even as a kid, I was a bit scared of like seeing like huskies and malamutes and Aww. stuff, like dog, because I thought, yeah, this is going to fucking rip me apart. But I'm fine now. But as a young <laughs> Holy guacamole. (laughs) Not running away from other people's German shepherds and (laughs) Yeah. Years of counselling, but uh I can pat that German shepherd now. But no, it's yeah, it was a thing when I was a kiddo. So uh that's that's what got me the most. (laughs) All right, the next question, Miss Hart. If a studio was to make a game or movie about your biggest fear slash fears, what would it be about and who would you cast to play as yourself? Oh, um, so like my biggest fear is, is obviously, as I mentioned, deep underwater. Um, like, so that is a legitimate fear of mine. But the other fear that I have is kind of like, um, I have a very like detailed imagination. And then sometimes if in a dark space, my brain's really good at saying, Hey, there's a fucking like a ghost or there's like a demon or some kind of evil figment that's like there. Like it's really, really good at just putting it there in detail. So I kind of imagine this game would be like some deep underwater horror where there's these like ghostly figures appearing that you probably couldn't fight. Um, 
So yeah, I guess it'd be kind of like a, you know, survival horror game, but set in the depths of the water. So maybe you'll be in some kind of like underwater facility or something like that. And there'd have to be some like swimming or kind of underwater swimming kind of like elements too. And darkness, there's a lot of darkness in there. So oh, oh, just thinking about this makes me like not feel good. Who to cast? I mean, I always want Aubrey Plaza to play me, but I think for this kind of vibe, this kind of spooky kind of vibe i think um uh, kristen ritter uh i think she'd probably fit the vibe much better mm, i like that i can see both those uh females doing well in the role of miss ally hart there mm. uh, nautical scientist trapped underwater the base has uh the, the pressure in the base has broken and it's starting yeah. to flood and the the spirits of yesteryear are coming to get you yeah. like uh, yeah it, it'd give you the heebie-jeebies like I think of things like, uh, you know, some some nods to like Bioshock and True, yeah. Soma and stuff like that down that vein. Good, yeah. uh, good translate. So well. it's like either the ghosts and demons or whatever are going to get you or, yeah, I guess you're going to die because the place is going to get flooded. So Yeah, maybe you've got a certain amount of time to get out. Yeah. It's either you, yeah, die by the water or die by the, by the creatures or the spirits. Yeah. <gasps> mm, I like it. I like it. So uh, my my concept, uh, I'm isolated out in the wilderness, completely mm-hmm. cut off. It's just myself, all the tropes. My phone's broken, no batteries, no radio, all that kind of stuff. It's just myself, lost out in the wilderness. I don't know why I'm out there. I'm just I'm just out there. We can we can pad that story <laughs> out later. But yeah, it's just myself, lost out in the wilderness, getting chased by some form of of monster or creature. May, maybe we go back to the well and it's some kind of like oh, well. rabid wolf type of creature. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe 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 we lean right back into that and go, yeah, it's 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 a werewolfy type of being that's that's coming for me and it's coming for my blood. Maybe I was out there with with family or friends, and they all got slaughtered, and I'm the only one alive right now, and I'm running for my life trying to find uh, find safety from this creature. So, yeah, I'm I'm out there. Give me some, give me some third person. I could maybe go first person. I could I could work with either of those if we were going into sort of a game style. Uh, but yeah, out in the wilderness, you know, a lot of fog, a lot of high sort of spindly trees. You know, that type mm. of real Little eerie boy, forest. Witchy. Yeah, real Blair witchy, uh, running around with like a, a torch that's obviously, it's going to be intermittent, as they always are. And outside of that, I've got a lighter and, and a couple of things. So I'm living off the land, trying to fashion weapons out of out of tree branches and stuff. Very primitive sort of dial it right back, no guns and things. And I'm just trying to uh, make my way and survive survive maybe it's a night maybe i'm trying to survive the night oh, no. out in this wilderness and uh you know daybreak is going to be going to be my safety net so uh that's my thoughts i was, I was struggling with the cast but then you came up with a beauty and, and said ryan hurst mm. who uh you know played opie in uh sons of anarchy who was in um remember the titans he's, he's been in a ton of things <laughs> great great movie by the way remember the Titans. i've seen it too many times and just as, <laughs> at school alone <laughs> Yeah, school love pumping that movie. Uh, it's like <laughs> we got two hours to kill this afternoon, kids. We need a movie that's got a good Remember message that's not too offensive. Fire up! Remember the Titans. Wheel out the TV in the VHS yep. player on the on the on the on the little table. Fire it up. So I'm gonna go Ryan Hurst. Uh, you know, he's a bit of a like he's he's a lot taller than me, so I'm I'm happy about that. But uh, you know, bit of a grizzled dude. Got uh, got some nice salt and pepper going in a very unkempt beard and hair, like myself right now. So uh, I think that'll go well. And he's uh, he's a good actor. So yeah. uh, that's 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 my game or my movie. I, th- I think we've got some pretty good games. I wouldn't play your game; it'd be too scary. And I'm definitely not playing <laughs> mine. Um, I think they're good ideas. I'm gonna you know patent pending on those copyright that's it let's uh let's reach out to some studios and see if there's some interest there but uh <laughs> we'll, we'll shift gears we're gonna go to another uh fuck marry kill oh, God. and uh this one i don't see many positives coming out of these three we've got here we've got pinhead we've got leatherface and we've got captain spaulding so we've got <laughs> uh we've got hellraiser we've got uh texas chainsaw massacre and then we've got house of a thousand corpses so uh, which way are you going? What's what's your three? Maybe maybe we can rapid fire these ones off and say your three in one, and then I'll say my three in one, and then we'll jump into a couple more questions. It's so positive in this one for me. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm going to kill Leatherface because he's just every kind of gross. Mm, I guess fuck Pinhead. 
he'd be into some weird shit, but <laughs> um and marry Captain Spaulding, he has a successful business. That's <laughs> he, fair. And he likes fried chicken, he sells fried chicken. There we go. Um <laughs> kill that's, the face, that's fuck good him head, and marry Captain Spaulding for his chicken, his famous ch- fried chicken. And that, he's that's horror fair. ride. Uh- <laughs> I, I had that initially, but I'm gonna just flip it up just so we got some different different responses. Yeah, I think I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna agree. We're gonna kill Leatherface. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's he's a very very simple, twisted soul, and I don't think the sex would be dangerous because he'd bring that chainsaw to the bed with you for one. And marrying him, there's gonna be no value added to that relationship. Like, uh, you know, I don't think he's gonna not gonna cook. He's got, not gonna clean. He's just gonna be bl- bringing fucking dead bodies home all the and time. He's gonna be mess everywhere all the time. He'll be like, "Who's so, that face? Like, yeah. Whose face is that? Where'd you get that yes. face from? <laughs> <laughs> Who have you been Look hanging at me out when with? I'm talking to yeah. you? <laughs> don't you put that angry face with me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling today? And he just whips Where a face out of the drawer and puts it on. <laughs> yeah, so that like as, as humorous as that sounds, that'd get a little bit much as far as that. So I'm just gonna I'm killing off Leatherface. I don't want to deal with him and his family. I'm going to I'm gonna have sex with Captain Spaulding because I'd love to have postcoital fried chicken afterwards. Mm-hmm. Just give me the chicken. I don't, I don't want fried chicken for the rest of my life all day every day. I want it at select moments. So, you know, he can be my, my little my little sex buddy, my little sex toy on the side. But I'm going to I'm gonna marry Pinhead. Uh, you know, he, he seems very big on family. You know, he cares a lot about his True. Cenobites. True. So, uh, yep, that is one thing. I know he's going to be loyal in that regard. Uh, but also, we can travel across time. We can travel to other planets. We can oh. go all types of places. So I can see the world. I can see the universe. Is there a chance I might get severely mutilated along the way? Maybe. Uh, is the sex going to be absolutely bananas? And um, the fact that I don't like... I, I like a kiss. I'm, a, I'm an affectionate man. It's going to be tough trying to kiss Pinhead all the time and not get pinned in the face. So that's going to be a thing we're going to have to work out. But, um, yeah, I, I can see a good relationship transpiring with, with Pinhead based off his family values, being able to travel interstellar. Uh, I don't think... I want to be wearing the leather. Oh, I was going to uh, ask. <laughs> I was going to ask if that was going to be a pro about having I a really. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I hope he's just going to let me be, and I can still be my own man. He's and... wearing his very, you know, complex leather outfit. And you're just sitting next to him with a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, just in a hoodie and chinos. I'm like, what's up, Penny? What do you want to do today? You know, want to go to the movies? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm going to marry Penny. Pinhead. <laughs> that's that's my term of endearment for him, Penny. Yeah, yeah, I love you, Penny. But uh, yeah, that's that's where I'm going with that three. But I want fried chicken now. God damn it! I'll ask my husband. No, uh. we'll get some today. All right. So the next question: uh, What's a studio or game franchise you'd like to go like? You'd like to go down a spooky direction, a la Red Dead Redemption, Undead Nightmare. Give me Nathan Drake fighting clickers or Agent Forty Seven taking out Dracula, and that comes mm. by way of Australia's Jono himself. So, Miss Hart, I um, I sort of was having a bit of a think about this one and mm-hmm. I'd like to see Bioware mm-hmm. maybe go down this route. Like, we've gotten, we've gotten little tastes. We've gotten little little sort of um, samples of, of some of the horror in Mass Effect uh, with, with um, stuff like the Overlord and Leviathan missions and just the, um, the husks and the banshee screams and stuff. Like, there is some moments that are a little bit heebie-jeebie, but... I want them to fully lean into space horror and do like a big space horror um, RPG type of thing. Just, you know, Mass Effect R-rated in in hell. Ooh. You know, if, if we need to comp something, you know, think of stuff like Event Horizon and things like that as far as Ooh. freaky movies. Like I know we get, we get a bit of that and like Dead Space is probably mm-hmm. the best space horror out there. But if we could sort of, tie in that narrative writing and that character development and, and maybe we have some type of space horror paragon and renegade system with mass effect where it, it fully leans into it i'd be hella down for that and then i um, also wanted to mention insomniac tackling the the dark universe or the universe of monsters universe mm. so you you play the role of a, a hunter so i guess you could, if you wanted to you can you play van helsing if you want 
easy done. And you're tasked with hunting down, you know, Dracula, Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, all those types of creatures. I think that could be really cool. And uh, Insomniac have shown that they can do really good open world games. Yeah. Combat's tight. Graphically, it's going to look fantastic. The writing's going to be really good. And I also just wanted to say an honorable mention to uh, Naughty Dog, where they could pretty much just reskin and just, uh, you know, fresh coat of paint and change things up ever so slightly with like the Uncharted franchise and just turn it into the mummy. <laughs> Instead of Nathan Drake, you know, let's chuck Brendan Fraser in let's there. Let's do it. Let's go. And Rachel Weiss, get her in there, get their likenesses, get those characters running around and, uh, you know, fighting the mummy and and even the, the <laughs> drunk um, the drunk brother. Is it the brother of Rachel Weiss? It's the brother of Rachel Weiss. He's not necessarily drunk as much as he is just a greedy bastard, really. Yeah. The bumbling idiot brother. Get him mm. along too, just to to make a little bit lighter in tone so we can have sort of that horror Do comedy type kid, of vibe. Though? No, no. The, that, that third <laughs> movie... Pfft, that's done, especially because the they. they... Too. Oh, he is yeah, the kid? He, he gets the he gets the little map claw thing on his wrist, and that's why he gets kidnapped and why they chase him over to Egypt. Oh, oh sorry, I was thinking in the third one where the kid yeah. is like Older. early adult, yeah. and they don't even have Rachel Weiss in the third no. one. They've got the woman from Coyote Ugly playing her, which is <laughs> a whole thing again. But give me, give me the Mummy game imagined, reimagined in the Uncharted world Start, naughty yeah. dog i think would do very well with that so that's that's what i'd like please and thank you yeah um i, I kind of cheated and i think i pre- we discussed this previously when there was a bit of discussion about quantic dream um working on a star wars related thing um uh, but yeah like if, if i could if it could be anything um i would love this like kind of you know quantic dreams like heavy rain maybe really gory kind of like seven like the movie seven like yes. that kind of like thriller <clears throat> like dark and you know gruesome kind of detail and just make it like a crime solving game like quantum dream had heavy rain where it was like crime solving picking up clues and then just really like fuck it up in the star wars universe so i i I, that's what i'd like that'd be pretty cool yeah i'm i'm keen as a bean for something like that give me some real hard disturbing criminal profiling crime solving detective work game like uh like condemned i loved back in the day which sort of had some nods and beats to this Mm. and um the next entry in the uh dark pictures looks like it's going to lean into stuff like this maybe from the brief trailer i saw but uh yeah I'd, i'd love to play a game like that where you're playing this this sort of broken detective potentially maybe you're you know you're once a star in the in the police community and you've had a situation, so now you're this grizzled drunk dude and you've got this this uh, case that's come back on you and it's, you know, some type of serial killer from your past that escaped and you yeah, sign me up, Miss Hart. I'm yeah. in. And it's the uniqueness of the Star Wars universe, so they can be any kind of, like, you know, fucked up and, the, you know. Jar Jar Binks' cousin. <laughs> Misa serial killer. <laughs> Oh my god, he is quite the glitch. And speaking of other glitches, uh, via Conpie on Discord has asked, what is your favourite or most memorable spooky in-game glitches? So um, there's a lot out there. There is an absolute bucket load out there. Um, As far as ones that come to mind for me, there's not a ton that sort of stand out. One that you're going to talk about in a second is brilliant. Yeah. Very twisted and warped and terrifying way. But uh, one that I remember from uh, Fallout 3 uh, was what happens sometimes is um, after you've after you've killed somebody, if you save the game and then return back into that game, the dead character becomes like a pile of body parts, but it's like freestanding where the character was. So Ooh. there was sometimes occasionally like eyes and like skull bones and brain fragments and stuff and like just this weird like art attack build up of this person of just their appendages and um yeah because the glitch sort of forgot to tell the game i guess that these body parts were scattered on the floor (laughs) so let's rebuild this character really fast so put them all into the default position then sometimes uh your character or other npcs could interact and have discussions with this (laughs) you know pile of bits so it was was pretty freaky, Pilot pretty hits. funny. Like wasn't like it looked a bit scary, but it wasn't like nightmare fuelish. Mm. And then um, mentioning uh, fear earlier in Fear Two, where we had Alma. There was a glitch in the first level; she wouldn't vanish, so she'd the be chasing model. you all the time. 
yeah, yeah, the character model was just sort of transfixed there. So it just added to this tension where she was just always there. Was like, just, you know, young, young, freaky characters like that where they're leaning into that, like that ring aesthetic, yeah. I guess, if you want to call it that. Yeah, that's just, spooky um, girl. You know, that's, that's freaky, freaky deaky, Miss Hart. Mm. But, um, What's another glitch that you wanted to bring to the table here? It's like less about being like too like like crazy spooky, but it definitely like the first time it happened to me, I was like, oh, what the fuck? Um, in The Sims, there was like an issue. It was either I'm pretty certain it was in Sims Three, um, where your baby like the baby child model would have these weird like arm glitch things so they'd actually like turn into like weird like spider slender men. like yeah. their arms and their limbs would just like go all mangled and long. And, like, I just remember the first time it happened when I was playing The Sims. I'm like, what the fuck happened to my baby? It was like, like, I was ready to put it in the fire. Like, it was just, <laughs> it looked like it was like a demon. And, like, it, it, these, I don't think that it got fixed. Like, I think it was, it actually happened in the later game as well, like in Sims 4 as well. So, um, but, yeah, it's it's pretty screwed up when it happens. It's just like your baby just goes full demon. Definitely jump on YouTube or Google, uh, you know, Sims child or baby, baby glitches glitch, yeah. and some of the photos and the video it's it's some shit you'd see in dead space like those little demon babies in dead space with little blade arms and stuff <laughs> like it's not too far from what happens in no. the sims here so <laughs> check that out but there's so many so many other games where you see weird texture pops or just the the facial models just don't render in and the eyes start protruding yes. out or the faces get warped and stretched and whatever like there's Same so way. many uh, ju- you could you could jump on YouTube and and um, watch so many like I wouldn't even say like you know best ofs but like there is you know top tens and top twenties as far as worst or best glitches depending on how you want to interpret that mm. uh, and some of them are truly truly freaky Miss Hart yeah pretty yeah. speaking of freaky deaky what current gaming trend are you more scared of evolving into the norm in the coming years? So we're talking, uh, you know, constant delays, pushing unfinished games, free to play with tons of microtransactions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm, I like I, I I have this thing where I'm still not big on um, game like companies releasing a trailer for a game that's not coming out for years. That just that that like kind of like that long kind of drawn out kind of experience of waiting and obviously now in the past two years because you know everything we've experienced delays so then it's just made it really 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 bad but I just I'm not really liking these like long like long waits of like game trailers like we've had actually recently the experience of um, some companies like literally dropping a trailer and saying it's coming out like next month or it's coming out in two months time. And I enjoy that. So I really just don't like this, like, oh, let's build the hype up now, even though this game isn't coming out until like three years, four years or whatever. That's, 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 it's, it's something that's really, really bothersome. And I think it's always going to be a trope because I understand there's like a financial thing attached to it. There's obviously, you know, shareholders and all that sort of bullshit. But yeah, I just, I just don't like it. I'd rather the opposite happen. Yeah. So, so you don't, you don't want more of this. A trailer announcement in 2021, but the game comes out in 2030. Like, yeah. you, you want the you want that anticipation to be potentially brief and just keep it at a high level so you don't wane and go, fuck, this is never coming out. Yeah, or the, the hype level just absolutely dwindles. Like, it happened to me with Borderlands. It happened to me with Deathloop. Like, we just kept on getting, like, like it, get, it would get pushed back or whatever, or we just constantly just... It would constantly become like trailer after trailer after trailer after trailer after announcement after event. And I'm like, I'm sick yeah. of this now. I don't care. Yeah, it's it's a fine line, isn't it? Like, mm-hmm. you need something to to land and land big as far as that initial announcement to get the hype and the chatter going. But yeah, you don't need to have then a new update every month, you know. Or you know, the dev diaries and stuff are great and sort of seeing behind the scenes. But it, it's it's a bit of a tightrope they have to walk, don't they, to well, ensure yeah. that it doesn't become too oversaturated and and just then wash away uh, because everyone feels like they've probably made up a big enough opinion about the game. We're like, you know what? I've seen enough. It's not for me. Exactly. You you just need to see enough, like just a smidgen to go, fuck, I want to play this. I want to know more instead of, yeah, that's not for me. And then you move on. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what's happened to me. So that's that's kind of where I'm I'm sitting on the fence. 
justified justified my uh my gaming trend that i am scared to hell about is uh yeah definitely in the uh the pub- publishing and releasing of unfinished games mm. because um you know and and i guess that could sort of almost go hand in hand sometimes with the the oversaturation the pressure of all this marketing machine yeah. saying no, this game's the best and because the the momentum's going too much like the biggest one of, of note recently is still cyberpunk obviously yeah. that game came out and there was a mountain of weight on the game's shoulders came out and it was undercooked it was underdeveloped and there's patches upon patches coming out and like we we reported last week that the, the in air quotes next gen update isn't coming out until 2022 so it's not coming out for like a year and a half after, after the game yeah. initially released so even though I'm a very impatient individual and I want things now and I want things yesterday type of thing, I'm happy to wait for a product to have the optimum amount of time in the oven so it can come out and it's nice and fresh and tasty and <laughs> bug-free as possible because, yeah, there's nothing worse in life than purchasing something and then realizing it's half done or it's busted or, you know, it's it's not what it could be if it was fully realized for a few more months' time of development and, and sort of um, hard work in the back end. So, yeah, just um, yeah, stop releasing broken, unfinished things, please. Yeah. Easier said than done, though, because I know they've got investors, investors to appease and the, you know, yeah. stock to try and maintain at a good level and so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah, Miss Hart, that brings us to the last question before we jump into um, a couple of final segments here. But... Um, mm. I thought we'd say, what are three horror titles that you'd recommend, regardless of uh, you know popularity or reception? So uh, this can be video games, this can be film, this can be TV. What are you going to recommend? Um, I'll recommend the movie Sinister, uh, underrated horror gem. I think um, it. I don't know why it didn't get the reception it did, but luckily a lot of people are discovering it now. Um, it's great. Uh, found footage uh, kind of spooky movie so Sinister is one of my recommendations uh, I spoke of this game before which was Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly um, I just I always like the mechanic um, it's got that vibe of Japanese horror and obviously not having a weapon yet having to face the evil that is chasing you which I think is just kind of cool and creative and the overall vibe of that game is pretty spooky in general and um, I'm going to recommend Ringu or Ring, which is the original Japanese uh, Ring movie. A lot of people tell me that they've seen the Ring movie, but they're referring to the American one. Um, I f- mm. don't find that one scary at all, but the original one fucked me up. That was the first horror movie where I couldn't sleep. Um, I saw things in that weren't there. Um, the static noise in the TV still gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, so that was like the first movie that really, scary movie that really like fucked me up. So go watch the original Japanese ring. Thank God we have digital signals on televisions oh, yes. now and don't have to deal with the old, uh, yeah. like the TV static and interference noises. Because yeah, it is... It is a constant ominous sound that has been instilled in us from gaming and film and TV over the years. Like when you hear that on a telly, nothing good's usually coming. No. <laughs> but uh, so thank God it's digital and we don't cop that anymore. Uh, great Rex. I couldn't agree more on all of those. I'm going to add a few more and I did say three, but uh, I'm greedy and I just want to talk about all the good things. So <laughs> I'm going to recommend The Cabin in the Woods first and foremost. Horror with some comedic elements to it. Very unlike most horror movies out there. Like, I don't want to go into the story because the story is great and fantastic and unique. But it's it's it starts with very much that standard slasher horror trope where you've got the, you know, the, the bunch of attractive college friends going away on a holiday um, for a weekend in a cabin in the woods and then hijinks and craziness ensue from there. So check it out. It is so great. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite horrors of all time, just because it's so different and so unlike a lot of lot of um, horror films out there, and just some of the twists and where they take the story is just mm, phenomenal. Obviously, Resident Evil. Uh, whether you want to play the OG games from the '90s or you want to play the 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 wave of remakes that are happening now, uh, you can't go wrong either way. I love that franchise so so much. I'd also like to recommend. I'm going to loop this in as one, and I'm going to say Alien and Aliens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so Scott, 
and then Cameron's uh, two alien films from the, the 70s and 80s, two of my favourite <laughs> movies of all time. And I'm going to say some honourable mentions, rapid fire style, ready or not. I really liked it. Miss Hart, not so much, but I think it's phenomenal. I love Samara Weaving. I love that sort of, yeah, more of that horror, horror black comedy sort of style that weaves in horror? with The Cabin in the Woods. Yeah. <laughs> it's got some horror elements to it. <laughs> I'm a stickler. <laughs> you leave it alone. The Thing, one of the best sci-fi horror movies of all time. And last but not least, I also want to mention uh, Penny Dreadful. Oh. which is a very, very underrated show. The first few seasons are perfection. The back end of the show sort of derails a little bit just because they got cancelled and then had to try and wrap up the story. Mm-hmm. So they, they managed to do that, but I think they had more to tell. But it's, you know, period, piece, horror, uh, very gothic horror. The cast is phenomenal. Eva Green is an absolute goddess in this in this show and it's just so good. It is so good to watch. The writing's great and the acting is phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, do yourselves a favour and check out Penny Dreadful. The first two to three seasons. I'm going to, since you cheated, um, I'm also going to do an honourable mention. And it's a little bit out there, but I'm going to recommend people to look online for a thing called The Local 58. Um, it's a YouTube horror, like, web series anthology kind of thing. And it's, like, usually released, like, it's been around since 2015, I think. It's been, like, this... Um, uh, Chris Straub, who's a creator of it, he releases these segmented, um, like little YouTube videos, and it's about like, uh, like a lo- It's meant to have the vibe of like a local t- like TV station, um, but like there's all this like anthology to it. There's all this like back lore to it. There's a lot of people that are trying to break it down, trying to understand it, find the hidden meaning in it, and it's, I love it. It's like so creepy and so well done. So it's called the Local Fifty Eight, and you can find it on YouTube. I've heard of this, but I've never looked at it. And I've just had a quick peek as you've been talking. I'm like, fuck yeah. How have I not checked any of this out before? Yeah. I love it. It's I love so this cool. idea. Okay. I'm going to I'm gonna check this out and come back to you in the coming weeks and give my thoughts. But no, it looks, looks really interesting. It's pretty cool. I'm down. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm very much down. And um, all right. Speaking of being down, I guess I'm down for this next part. Tweet of the week. And this tweet is not a tweet. It's an Instagram post, but there was some mentioning (laughs) on Twitter as well. But the Instagram post had more more detail because you can go above that 250-odd characters. This comes via way of Bloody Disgusting, fantastic uh, horror media outlet. Uh, They cover video games. They cover television. They cover film. They do a lot of really good stuff. I uh, get a lot of my horror fixes and wrecks from there. Mm. But, um, yeah, this post was uh, splashed with the graphic. And it was A Quiet Place, a terrifying new video game. Experience an un- untold story of survival in the Quiet Place universe coming 2022. So Saber Interactive, who created the World War Z game mm. and are currently working on the upcoming Evil Dead game, has announced a video game based on John Krasinski's A Quiet Place. Saber Interactive will be teaming with developers Illogica and Epitome to create a single-player story-driven horror adventure game based on the film franchise with the game aiming to release in 2022. Mm. So, this is interesting. Uh, World War Z, not the best reviewed game in the world. So, the track record there leaves you to pause a little bit. Yeah. But (laughs) Evil Dead, the game coming out in, I think, February now or back end of January. Yeah. I can't remember. Q1 2022. Looks good. Looks true to the source material. Looks like it could be fun to play. So hopefully this is more Evil Dead as opposed to World War Z, Miss Hart. But it's just gonna is this just gonna be The Last of Us with that's, faster, <laughs> that's creepier what I was gonna monsters? ask you because like I haven't seen this quiet place movie. Um so I only have a basic understanding of everything that kinda of goes on in it. But the thing that everyone references, it says it's a movie version of The Last of Us. So then I'm like, hang on, if someone makes a game based on this movie, then wouldn't the game be The Last of Us? So I'm very curious. No, yeah, like like number two certainly hits on similar beats to The Last of Us um game franchise yeah. and now soon television franchise. So I'm curious to know which way they go with this, but I like the I like the possibility of this game. The dogs clearly don't. They're out of here. They've yeah, had enough. They're like, fuck this quiet place. They've had <laughs> enough. They're just little sissy boys. But um, 
I like the possibility of this game playing more on the sound-based mechanics. Mm. So whether it be if you're using maybe like a PlayStation DualSense and it can pick up if you're making noise, like when, you, when you're playing certain games, like when you're playing Alien Isolation, yeah. if you had a headset on and you're making noise or breathing too heavily, the Xenomorph could hear you and come find you. So if they had those types of mechanics in this game where you need to be quiet in real life as well as in the game for these demon things to not come and get you. I think that could be really cool and a nice mechanic that's not um, utilised heavily enough. No, they they had that mechanic in that game series of Welcome to the Game where you were a hacker but, like, you were hiding from people and then they had the, the mic setting. So, like, if there's a moment where you're supposed to be hiding and then if you breathed or you made a noise into your mic you'd get discovered and you'd get attacked. So I, I think that's cool. I, I think that's a really cool mechanic. Probably not fair to anyone that maybe has a house full of people. <laughs> but That's true. That's true. That It'd be tough to succeed, yeah, if you're in a, in a rowdy share house or something. Yeah. But if they lent into that a little bit more, and, and I guess this game would be very be very slow paced like it'd be very oh. much just stealthing around a lot yeah like you do a lot in the last of us and things like that too so we'll see we'll see it's crazy that this game's coming out next year and it was only announced you know at the back end of 2021 so maybe they've been working on this for a little while maybe you'd, you'd hope you'd hope right <laughs> well yeah <gasps> yeah but um yeah that brings us to the end of the tweet of the week we might quickly just New releases Rattle off on a few events. things that are dropping this coming week. If you're looking for things to do outside of playing some of the games we've recommended, maybe you're going to be watching some of those movies and TV shows we just talked about. But as far as new things coming out this week, um, outside of our usual 8-bit related podcasts, Marvel's The Eternals hits the cinemas this week officially here in the AU. I don't know if it's already out in America. I think it might be. I think it maybe. may be by this time, yeah. Yeah, but it's but it's officially out in all the cinemas this week. Uh, as far as games coming out, we've got Unpacking, World oh. War Z making its way to the oh. Switch. <laughs> Unpacking looks fun. Though. Unpacking looks like the, like it's such a kind of like niche idea, but yeah, it's great. It looks great. Yeah. Love the concept. We've also got our Bloodshore coming out. Just Dance 2022. The Binding of Isaac Repentance oh. is coming out. Where Cards Fall and Call of Duty Vanguard. That came up quick. Yeah. Holy guacamole. Yeah. It is out this week. And then also, last but not least, Let's Build a Zoo is coming out this week. Oh. Love me a zoo builder. Love me a world builder. Yeah. You're going to build a zoo, Miss Hart? Possibly. <laughs> Maybe. Mm. If I'm not packing stuff. Yeah. I, like, I want to play COD, but I don't have immediate urgency <laughs> to pick it up day one. No, nah, me either. I'm working my way through Guardians of the Galaxy at the moment. Ooh. And um, we'll be doing a, I'll be doing a bit of a spoiler-free review on that on THG 262 next week. So I'm just solely focused on playing that, finishing that off this week, and also just still watching far too much high fantasy anime because I can't stop. Listeners, send help. go to our Discord because now there is a dedicated section for... Because Brendan obviously is just on a fucking anime purge. So there's now a dedicated section in our Discord where Brendan can just talk about all the freaking anime he's watching. <laughs> Well, spoilers, there is many. There's a there lot. There's many and there is much. There's a yeah, lot. I have been uh, consuming so much. Like, uh, watched uh, all of Rise of the Shield Hero this week. <laughs> and i um, happy to know that there's a season two coming out in April of 2022. So I don't have to wait too long for more of that because I really like that show. Brilliant. It's really good. <laughs> all right, Miss Hart, that brings us to the end of THG 261, the spooky edition for 2021. Anything else you'd like to say? <laughs> anything else you'd like to say or share before we close uh, the studio down for another week? No, thank you, Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. So uh, until next time, Apeit Nation, much love. And stay spooky. Welcome to the family song. 